Hello and welcome back to the old school MMA review. Welcome as we continue down memory lane looking at the old SEG UFC events. I am the fight nerd Matthew Kavlitz and joining me on the opposite side of the screen is Zane Simon from BloodyElbow.com. Zane, put that hand down. I know where it's been. That's more like it. <laughs> <laughs> been everywhere. It's a well-traveled hand. I don't want to know much more beyond that. <laughs> Especially with an event like the one we're going to be covering today, which is UFC 4, Revenge of the Warriors! Revenge! I still think they should have called this Enter the Beast. Well, yeah, in retrospect, they probably should have, but uh, he'll get his own eventually. That's fine. <laughs> That's right. He'll get his own coming. So yeah, it is UFC 4, Revenge of the Warriors, live. Well, at least it was live uh, back in 1994. It was 94, December, last right. event of 94. I knew it was in the next, so at this point... Uh, UFC was doing, I believe, three events a year, so they just really begun their actual official schedule, if you will, of, yes. uh, of UFC events, which were three a year at this point, and it would essentially remain that way for uh, the better part of the next decade. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, it's uh, it, th this is the start. This is the the clear beginning of the UFC as a polished product, as a viable franchise of television. Yeah, because you had one and two, which were these big martial arts tournaments gathering together all these different styles, and they didn't quite stop that. You still had a lot of style versus style. Everybody, a lot of black belts. We're not totally divorced from that idea at all, but it's a it, you've seen a direct shift. From the, you know, the one-off martial arts tournament to now, you know, all these returning fighters, all, you know, a much more focus on a very specific style of fighter, really a tough, well, you know, guy who can take a lot of punishment and also happens to have a black belt. And that, that was much more their push. And the production was much more polished. It was a much more, I had a set feel like we know how big the tournament's going to be. We have our alternates. We have all this stuff that's a very polished, smooth product every time. Yeah, so at this point, as we mentioned last episode, UFC had hit their stride, and UFC 4 has continued that stride. And now, you know, not only have we hit our stride production value, we now have begun to get established stars and faces, and fans are starting to recognize people. Uh, and that's why, you know, again, this one is Revenge yeah. of the Warriors, because there are a lot of guys returning at this event yes. that were in the last tournament. I, I, yes, they are all getting to revenge their various wrongs. The the family feud, the blood feuds, the, you know, somebody killed somebody's father well in the past. And not only that, we also have even uh, a guy, a few guys from UFC 1 reappearing, in fact. We'll mention them in, in a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's actually a big show in terms of uh, in terms of name power. And it also was, at this point, also the most attended UFC event. Uh, with an attendance of uh, over 5,800 people in the arena. That's a big, big jump from the last show. Yeah, yeah. It was, what, like 3,000 last time? Something like that, like three or 2,000. It was not that big of a show. Uh, so, obviously, a much bigger arena, and they're filling it. And uh, also up is the buy rate. You know, we went up now this time to 120,000, so we're up a little bit more. Uh, not quite as good as UFC 2 still, which no. uh, at this point holds the record still 200,000. But uh, 120,000, it's up, and that's what matters. Yeah. It went up, and it uh, went up a good amount. So we're getting more people watching. We're getting more people in the arena in all places in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, who knew there was MMA fans in Tulsa, yeah. Oklahoma? Who would have known? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Whatever. It's MMA. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, just put it anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, this time now we've got a lot of big changes happening. Uh, worth noting is the pay-per-view or rather the event poster, uh, which featured – and it's this is interesting – uh, in the original poster, it was Hoist Gracie and Steve Jenham's face. Because Steve Jenham, as you know, won UFC 3. He's now the champion. He is the man to beat. And his That's face right. now made onto the poster. At least it did for the actual hair view. For the later on VHS release, he's not on it. It's now just no. Hoist's face. And uh, a few other photos are still from the fight. But yeah, the original release Retros actually was hiking Jenham. Ret retrospectively, Steve Jenham's role in MMA history is basically nil. Which is unfortunate, because it was an important moment that when he won the tournament, but in reality, uh, not so much. <laughs> yeah, no. It, it was a footnote in the complete dominance of Hoist Gracie at this time in MMA history. This is a big, big one for Hoist. Uh, also worth mentioning, since we're going to talk about you know, them going back and changing things. Uh, I remember the original tape had this, too. It said, like, you know, uh, this tape features the full and uncut dramatic final. Because this is the this is really the longest final that we've ever had, and and longest fight in UFC history that we're going to see coming up. Um, yeah. Them trying to build that as something amazing. <laughs> Jokes on you guys, suckers. So let's just get into the show. Uh, 
And the, the uh. picture itself kicks off with the Nutcracker Suite. What the yes. fuck? <laughs> no joke, hey. people. If you haven't watched this UFC DVD yet, go out and buy it. You'll be surprised, and too. Play it for Christmas. Yeah. I, mean, I think technically we actually could play it because it is uh, probably public domain. So I might just cut it in here. I think I will. Yeah, I, I think we... You like how I'm assuming I'm gonna cut music here? <laughs> I probably won't. Just to make sure I just have you dance like that. I'm not gonna cut any music in at all. All right, just to make it extra awkward. Yeah, not like it wasn't already, but yeah. Nutcracker Suite kicks off the show with uh, again, actually a very uh, a very good gra uh, opening graphic CGI package. I, I also do think that the Nutcracker Suite was a very appropriate song to have at the start of the event. We'll get oh, yeah. to that later. It's it, well, yes, yeah. yes. It, it it was an impen it was a foreshadowing song. I think it actually fit really well though. I legitimately think yeah. it worked really well. It was it made no sense, but it was really well. I mean it, Oh it, yeah, no, I I loved it. And hey, it was Christmas time. It was Christmas time. I don't it's, know why they want to associate ultimate fighting with Santa Claus, but it worked. I I, I, I watch Roadhouse every Christmas. Maybe I should start watching UFC four. Yeah. It's the new Die Hard. That's right. It's the new Die Hard. So yeah, so uh, here we are, UFC 4, and, and you wanted to mention this, I know, I'll, I'll get this out of the way first, too. We have a whole new commentary team. Holy crap. Yeah. Goodbye, Ben Perry. <laughs> Long farewell, Bill Loss. Thank God. It's, the curse of Superfoot has now been Wait totally lifted. Path. It's been completely lifted. Uh, as we now have uh, Bruce Beck. Bruce Beck. Bruce Beck is here. Uh, or rather, Glenn, is it Glenn Beck or Bruce Beck? I, uh... it's, it's Bruce Beck. Oh, no. Beck. <laughs> the curse of Bill Loss is back. <laughs> if it, it would be... There would be a whole different show if it was Glenn Beck <laughs> presents the UFC. Oh, man. Yeah, so Bruce Beck, who is actually a very well-established, uh, at that point, New York sportscaster. So he's here. Yeah, he, he had a lot of polish. He is very polished. You could tell right from the start of the show, we were in for a much better commentary team. But even, yeah. even though he said some stupid stuff at the beginning of the show, like he wanted to mention. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's customary for these UFCs. You know, there's always some horrible intro, and uh, this was. Yeah, no I mean, they, they had the, this was the intro of Jeff Blatnick too. Who oh, yeah, Jeff Blatnick making his, uh, his octagon debut as he introduces the cage. And he, you know, despite his long great history of association with the UFC, you know, he, I wanted so badly for him to add a lot to the commentary team this time through, <laughs> and it was not happening. No, to be fair, though, I think he did a good job. We, we can rank the commentators after, but I think, uh, you know, Bruce and Jeff have a very good uh, repertoire. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? I, I need uh, words. Uh, Give me words. Uh, uh, they, faster, they had faster. A very You're under pressure good, now. You're fired. Go home. Now I'm saying relationship in my head. And this, is, this is because we invoked the curse of Bill Wallace, you realize. Like, this, right. we, we, we dare to say his name. This is what happens when you do that. Either way, good chemistry. That's all to say. Good I'll just do a Porky Pig. They had a good, but he even even chemistry. Yeah, and they worked out well. And uh, also returning, the only guy that returned really from the original team, kind of sort of, is Jim Brown. He's back. He's our third man in the commentator seat again. Yeah, and he and Jim Brown is always doing better than I expect. That's always the thing with Jim Brown. He always does improve here and there. He gets better with every show. Um, what better actually is is to be determined. <laughs> but he gets better each time. Um, and yeah, otherwise really. Original team is gone, uh, with the exception of one guy we'll see later. Um, also back, Leon Tabs, the uh, ringside doctor, Joseph uh, Estonek. We also have this time Tracy Asher, Ryan Dalton. Not like those names mean anything, but whatever. They got doctors there, and three of them this time. Wow, really uh, high production value for this show. They can afford three doctors. They, they want to maybe at some point stage the whole Stooges thing where they come in, you know, two guys trying to carry the stretcher and... One of them starts dropping it, and the, you know, trying to catch the, t take the blood pressure while hitting somebody with something. A couple of wise guys, eh? That's right. Yeah, and then, like I said, Leon Tabs is back. Uh, also back, Ultimate Man. He's back Ultimate in another Man. new logo. This time, his logo is now with a jackhammer. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't even understand. It looks awesome. You can never complain looks, about these logos, it but it looks, looks great. It looks awesome. It makes as little sense as humanly possible. But it looks so good. It looks so good. Uh, so yeah, I want to mention it feels that. right. It does feel right. Whatever old man does always feels right. Uh, so I want to mention I have a quote from Beck where he says, uh, "Revenge will be a major factor tonight," and that is true because as we mentioned, a lot of guys are returning. Uh, and I also want to yeah. mention something else that Beck said. He had his Bill Wallace moment, I guess, where he said that Gracie has never lost before. And yes. we talked about this quite in depth on the UFC three episode about how uh, 
technically, we feel that Hoist did lose. He, he already lost. Yes. We, he, we felt that he lost to Harold Howard at UFC 3. Well, and they even reported... It was one of the things they even reported Gracie's record with a loss in the last time. They were they, they reported him at like oh, no, oh they reported him at fifty one and eight for this eight. really it, for his eight. record that was his record for this event. But the Gracies have never lost. Never lost. Fifty one and eight. Never lost. It's a bizarre show, and and really rounding out the bizarreness is the return of Rich Goins and the debut of his porn mustache. <laughs> Hey, that, 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 you know, yeah, okay, that was bad. Wow, looking at that thing on his lip, it was just scary. I, I, man, that did not fit him at all. He's not a guy that should grow a mustache ever. No, no, he, he did not, he did not have the mustache going on, but, you know, Rich Goings has never been a, he's never been a, he's never been a strong point of the UFC broadcast, so I guess, he, he, you know, maybe he just felt like he needed to go that extra step of, like, to go, hopefully he's going for kitsch. <laughs> like, it's like, well, it's never going to be good, so it might as well be kitsch. Mustache. <laughs> Mustache. Oh. Man, it's going to be a long night. We got a whole eight-man tournament once again. The winner gets 60 grand. Uh, let's jump into, I guess, the fights right now. Let's go into the alternate fights, because they are... Uh, we didn't really get to see much of them, unfortunately, no. but they are worth mentioning, because, uh, you know, we did get to see number one, uh, Kevin Rosier. You guys remember him from UFC yes. 1. He came back. Kevin Rosier was back. He, this was his last time this in the it. UFC. All right. Well, and th this was, I mean, as it was his last time in the UFC, last time we're going to talk about him, he, Kevin Rosier is not a happy story in MMA. He he had a combination. Apparently, he was in the military before he entered his fighting career, and a combination of the fighting wear and tear and the military wear and tear have made, you know, he's apparently homeless or nearly so now and fortunately a lot of these guys go on to open their own gyms they stay in the sport they've got a lot of associations but you know kevin rosier is really sort of a reminder that not not every combat sports career goes the way you hope yeah it's a sad story about rosier and he unfortunately loses his uh, ultimate bout to joe charles the ghetto man uh, yes so joe charles will potentially get a chance to be in the tournament uh spoil oh, spoiler alert he does not uh, <laughs> yeah, not. Nah. I, I, I feel like I remember reading that he actually was a student of Gene LaBelle's. Am I getting that totally wrong, or do uh, you know? I'm not really sure about that, but you know, I do know we're going to see him again, so we'll have a chance to talk about him uh, next time, so we can do some research on Joe Charles and figure out what's up with that man. Yeah, the ghetto man. The ghetto man. Uh, you it's know, a terrible nickname, but it, he it chose really it, is. so it's, I'm yeah, not going to argue with it. It's his nickname. Uh, <laughs> and also, we had Marcus Bossett over uh, Eldo Diaz Xavier. Is that correct? Did I say that right? Did I say that? Yeah, I, I think I've heard it's Xavier Eldo Diaz. But I heard, I heard on, the, on the show they said uh, Eldo D Xavier. In fact, so yeah, they we can never I, trust you the never, UFC telecast. You never know with names on these guys. They they made all sorts of stuff up and changed all sorts of things. But yeah, Eldo Diaz Xavier, Xavier Eldo Diaz. First Brazilian not named Hoist Gracie to appear in the UFC, even though he only appeared in clips on the main broadcast. Yes, I, I believe. What was his style? He's a capoeira. Fighter? He was capoeira. He was. He is probably the only capoeira purist to ever appear in the UFC. Although we did have one fans previously. Who, fa fans who've gotten a hold of his whole fight say that he, uh, e even he, didn't appear particularly sold on the idea of capoeira. Yeah, so he didn't really do the uh, the back and forth motion. Uh, that's not what I'm hearing. I hear he was more of a box. Tried to do to ride the box. All right. Well, that makes sense because I believe he lost by strikes anyway. So that was a bad idea. He probably should have stuck with the Capoeira. He probably would have actually done better. Yeah. Yeah. And Bossett. I mean, I got a lot of respect for Bossett. We'll get that to that later. Yeah. With we'll this. come back to Bossett. Yeah. But, but and the other guy to, to to talk about here obviously is Guy Mesger. Well, his, yeah. Well, Guy Mesger, we'll talk about much later, but uh, yeah, Guy Mesger makes his debut in this UFC as well. But he actually is uh, something towards the end of the night, surprisingly. So we'll, we'll get to him later. Um, but yeah, let's, let's just get right down to the tournament itself. Uh, and things started off with uh, Ron Van Cleef versus Hoist Gracie. So Hoist gets the first fight of the night this time around. Yeah, and in a, in something that they have tried to do all throughout. I mean, I'm, chemo was a weird one, but I have to. In retrospect, you kind of have to think that they knew that that was all a big setup on Kimo's part, that he had no Taekwondo background, and that they 
gave him that fight early on because he had such a huge showy personality around it. Yeah. But every, all in the first four <laughs> UFCs, they wanted to get they, they really did want to give Hoist a feature fight at the beginning of each event. You know, in the first one it was Genom, then it was Ichihara, then it was Kimo, now it's Ron Van Cleef. A karate man, Ron Van Cleef, the Black Dragon, a movie star as well. Uh, and, and even calling him a karate man is weird. He was just a martial artist with the biggest air quotes I could make around it. Yeah. Well, he still uh, is involved in martial arts today here in New York City, in fact. Like, he's still very heavily involved up in Harlem, I believe, with uh, doing a lot of martial arts stuff with kids. So he's still active uh, yeah. in the sport. And uh, you know he he's actually the oldest man to date, I believe, still, to have competed yeah. in the UFC. And he competed here at 51 years of age. 51, looked great. He looked like Apollo Creed, if you ask me, with the American flag uh, shorts and the whole entrance. Like, oh, he was yeah, like, he was yeah, like yeah, Apollo yeah. Creed. He was totally trying to sell that. And it worked. Also, I think it worked. <laughs> it was one, but it was it was one of the worst showings in UFC history. Let's be clear. It was an easy fight for Hoist. No, no joke about it. It was an easy fight. It was a good fight for Hoist because again, it was a good warm up fight, and it just showed you know, BJJ versus karate again. So we got to see that again, and it doesn't hurt. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think Van Cleef, uh, you know, he looked like he's out there to kickbox. He looked like he's gonna be a little bit more spry, uh, you know. And Hoist took him right down pretty much. Uh, you know, Hoist did what he do. Um, I, I felt he was respectful, and, and oddly enough, I think actually Hoist, uh, you know, I complain about this, especially UFC 2, where Hoist was a dick to a lot of guys, hold up oh, yeah. holes too long. Uh, this is a different Hoist that we see tonight. Uh, I think he's been humbled since UFC 3, and he's very yeah. different in how he is during the fights and after the fights as well. He's they, no longer holding on to they said in the broadcast that he, he, like, his father pulled him aside and told him to stop being a dick or something at some point. Something like that, yeah. Well, basically, just not to hurt opponents more than it needs to. That's what that's what, that's what they actually said. That, that's, that's what they, yeah, that's what they said. And it, I didn't know that I saw a whole lot of him not trying to hurt people, but he was maybe less of a dick. Yeah, I, I think it's a slightly more mature hoist here. I think is, uh, yeah, he needed that beating from Kimo basically to get that out of him. You know, like when yeah, he Kimo. That, that that did more for him than anything else. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, really, the fight itself not really much worth mentioning to be quite honest. Uh, easy fight for hoist. Uh, Van Cleef did about as good as we'd expect him to do for a guy that's 51. But I think, yeah, if, you know, at 51 years of age against a guy like Hoyce, in the style of the fighting that it was going to be, you know, good enough. I mean, well, I think I think Van Cleef, they had no, he had no reason to be there whatsoever. That's my personal feeling. It was a good sell. It was a good selling point to have a 51 year old guy in there. I think that's I think that's only about this card that it had was uh, a lot of good selling points. Well, well, and apparently Van Cleef afterwards said that he broke his ankle a week before the fight. But considering that he didn't have any wrap on his ankle, either of his ankles at all, and neither of them appeared to be particularly swollen or damaged in any way whatsoever, which you can clearly see him in the fight. Yeah. I mean, it it, it, it sounds like, you know, trying to, his own attempts to change history after the fact for what I say is, like I say, is one of the worst performances in UFC history. I don't want to go that far, but definitely wasn't that impressive for anybody. It was just uh, a good win to put Hoist into the next round, basically. It wasn't much more beyond that. Yeah. Uh, you know, Van Cleef's fighting abilities, we really never know much beyond uh, what we saw here. And, uh, you know. No, we can wa go watch some old movies of him. Oh, we know he choreographed The Last Dragon. That's right, he did choreograph The Last Dragon with Tymok. That's right. And uh, Should I cut some of those footage in there? Uh, I guess I will. Yes, yes, you have to. All right, Leroy, who's the one and only map? I so Hoist gets the win. Surprise, surprise, slash no one is surprised. Let's move on to the next fight, uh, which is, you know, it might be my favorite of the night. That's saying a lot. Joe Sun is back and Keith Hackney is back. Retrospectively, it's a much it's a much more fun fight. Then I mean, at the time it was it was a fun fight, but in in retrospect, it's even more fun. Oh my God, yeah, Joe Sun versus Keith Hackney. So Joe Sun, remember from UFC three, was Kimo's manager, and he was causing yeah. all sorts of trouble. You know, he's getting running around the ring apron, yelling at the Gracies. It became it almost became a brawl, quite honestly, between yeah. the Gracies and and Kimo's corner. Uh, so this time around, Joe Sun is the one in the cage. And uh, not chemo. So Joe Sun. Yeah. Uh, oh man, did I write down his quote? I didn't write down his quote, but he basically gives us the same religious thing that chemo said the last time. Uh, yeah. 
Man. In the cage, he actually turns to the camera and says, Christ is my Lord. Yeah, that's, it's, it's like a gangster, that, too. He's like, Christ is my Lord! Yeah. yeah so we, we gotta talk about this, too. His whole entrance, everything about Joe Sun. So he comes in, basically, you know, as you remember, Kimo last time did the whole cross entrance. This time, Joe Sun tries out himself, but the problem is Joe Sun is not quite the powerhouse that Kimo was. Yeah, so, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure he might have used a bigger cross, too. <laughs> Well, to be honest, it's hard to tell because Joe Sun is five foot four and two hundred sixty five pounds. Yeah, uh, which is, by the way, the heaviest man in this tournament. <laughs> yes. He's the heaviest and the shortest man in the tournament. Wow! So we're going yeah. two for two here. Um, so I want to mention this too because this is really important here. His entrance. So we have Joe Sun on the cross. We have two guys walking out with the religious sayings. One of them is Kimo. We have a, a Korean guy who's shirtless wearing hakama pants, and then <laughs> we have we have surprisingly Pat Smith. Did you catch that? I didn't. Pat Smith is in Joe Sun's corner. Ah. Oh. And Joe Sun, so yeah, so we got Pat Smith, Kimo, Korean guy in Hakama pants, Joe Sun, his red Speedos, carrying a giant cross across the floor. Barely able to do it. I mean, this is just half amazing, half bizarre. I'm a little speechless. It was hard not to laugh. I think the commentators had the same problem as well. <laughs> yeah, it it was so, and of course, you know, I I, I wrote about this too, and I, if, if you're bad, because it, it, I mean, I kind of got it wrong. Which was that, unlike, unlike Kimo, they weren't willing to do Joe San the favor of billing him as a real martial arts expert. Yeah, he is. So a they billed him as a Joe Sando expert. What is Joe Sando? We will never know to this day what Joe Sando is. But unfortunately, is. they did actually bill him as a real martial arts expert too, as a third degree Taekwondo black belt and a Judo black belt. Wow! So he basically stole Kimo's belts. Yes. Yes, he stole he stole Kimo's belt and added Joe Sando on so you know, top of it. You know what he probably did is he stole Kimo's belt, and then while he was backstage at UFC 3, he took Christoph Leininger's belt from Judo, and that's, that's what he did. Right. So he does, ha he does have in his property and possession two black belts. They just weren't actually earned by him. Oh, and I, I want to get to this. We sort of breezed over it with the horrible ho Hoist Gracie Ron Van Cleef fight, but did you did you hear that story about how the how the Gracies learned jujitsu from the traveling Japanese? Yes, I did. I caught Bruce Beck uh, <laughs> randomly explaining the origin of jujitsu of Brazilian uh, jujitsu. Uh, yeah, a traveling salesman apparently traveling around the world he goes to Brazil, and uh, when he's not selling hats, he's selling jujitsu. I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I I love that. That that was very much classic. You know, it, make up some crap and we'll call it martial arts history. Oh, I did like how Bruce Beck got out of that. I think this might might be uh, first time they really actually explained it since the first UFC. They actually went to a little bit of detail, and it was the right amount of detail. Because again, you know, Beck is a very polished uh, commentator, yeah. so yeah, he got a lot of those facts during the night. He spit out a lot of random factoids, but I think it was important to have for this show, and a good way to introduce yeah. himself as opposed to Jeff Blatnick, who was just there. Yeah, Jeff Blatnick, he was really... It, this also came up in the Hoist fight. He was really struggling with the idea of what a submission was. Yeah, he did not quite know. I mean, Blatnick here, it's, he is a good commentator for wrestling, but he doesn't know yeah. much about mixed martial arts just yet. He will improve. Don't worry, yeah, he will improve. Yeah, he improves a lot. He's but a little green he, in this I mean, show. He was talking about, like, you know, like hip locks and... Yeah, all sorts of wrestling holds, basically. Yeah, all sorts of wrestling holds that made no sense, and he was really struggling to get an idea of what exactly Hoist was doing in any of his fights. It'll get worse later, but it yeah. was bad in the Hoist Gracie Ron Van Cleek fight. So, I, so I, have, I have a note here about uh, Joe Sun and Hackney's fight, and I wrote the tights, the cross, the testicles. <laughs> so, I think that means it's time to just go right into this fight here, because if Keith Hackney, who's returning. Yeah. From his amazing performance over Manuel Yarbrough, he's now totally a yes. fan favorite, for sure, after that fight. And for as high a point as the Manuel Yarbrough fight was, this is the crowning jewel in the crown in Keith Hackney's <laughs> it mantle. These crown jewels. <laughs> That's right, the crown jewels. Oh, the man. family jewels in Keith Hackney's mantle. Yeah, this fight was... Joe Sundo just... Uh, Joe Sundo did not belong in that cage, period. He did not belong there, no. and Keith Hackney showed him that. Um... It did not take long for this fight to end up on the ground. Uh, uh, humiliating for Joe Sun, quite honestly. And then the, the high point really is uh, when the fight goes to the ground. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I wish we could show the actual video, but I don't want to get sued by Zufa. But, man, yeah. I mean, it's just Keith Hackney is on top of Joe Sun, pulling his head forward against the fence, and just wobbling him in the balls. That's the whole yeah. fight right there, folks. Just And I counted, by the way. There's six shots on the ground, and he also connected with one 
uh, when they were clinching in the standings. So they actually were seven points yeah. to the groin total. Seven, I, yeah, you could just see the wind go out of Joseon's proverbial sails. As much more than wind, I think. <laughs> yeah. He was trying, I mean, he, because he was actually, you know, he was pushing Hackney around a little because his legs were, you know, that stumpy, wide. Yeah. But the moment that he started getting hit in the groin, it suddenly was just, he, he wanted nothing to do with it. He actually, I mean, but he submitted to a seat clamp choke. Yes, he did. That, that, that was the eventual submission was the throat choke. But the groin, the groin strikes that's were really the beginning of the end. Yeah, that's totally did it, man. Uh, also, note, once again, just like at UFC 3, uh, except this time Joe Sun's one in the cage, Kimo and his boys were running around the, the apron again. <laughs> Uh, you know, being the nuisances, and I, I think yeah. I heard at one point. I think Big John actually did find them. I think I heard him say, "That's it. That's two thousand. Nice. So I think he actually did find them for their stupidity. So good for him. Uh, good, so, good on Big John. So Pat Smith has to go buy his drugs somewhere else that night, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and, and so you know, you know, it's fun. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get that later. But man, so yeah, after the fight, also I, just, I thought it was kind of funny too. Like you know, Keith Hackney gets the clean win. Then like Joe Sun walks over to you know, they go do the hug thing. But like Joe Sun kind of like palm strikes him in the face before going to like hug him, or it's more like more like. Joe Sun palm strikes him, then yeah. Hackney ignores it and hugs him. He's like, yeah, I just beat you. Fuck you. Yeah, Joe Sun was... Yeah, he, Joe uh, what, uh, what a weird, weird man. Have you seen his wrestling video from when he did pro wrestling? I've seen everything Joe Sun has done. We will we will do a retrospective one day about Joe Sun. I think, I think, we, I think dude, the fans he, deserve a Joe Sun retrospective from us. For, yeah, from, from crazy Christian to, you know, to... Horrible murderer, the life and times of Joe Son. The right, the life and times of random task. Never has a fighter, ne never has a, a nickname been more deserved. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you think is his biggest claim to fame? Do you think it's being random task in Austin Powers or being punched in the dick by Keith Hackney? Unfortunately, it's random task, but it really, I mean, it should be being a, you know, being criminal scum. That too, being a gang raping criminal scumbag, I guess. That also. Awesome. Yeah. Let's save that for the end of the show, I think, because Joe Sun, he just deserves his own segment. But let's uh, let's move on to the tournament now. Next stage of the tournament, we have Steve Jenham and Melton Bowen. And Melton Bowen has the uh, distinguishing. What's the word I'm looking for here? I'm, I'm Bill Lawson again. I'm Bill Lawson again. Help me, Zane. Help me. He has, distinct, he, has, he has the distinction of being the first fighter to ever wear gloves, MMA gloves, in an MMA fight. Yes, thank and you for saving me. Really haven't changed much since then. No, he, he basically wore what ended up being the uh, the prototype for the glove, and what a lot of fighters did wear and have worn. Yeah. Still training. I, I know guys who actually still use those. Uh, I think it was the Harbinger gloves. Yeah, um, I mean they're, they're they were a type of bag glove, heavy bag glove, basically, and they ended up being MMA gloves. And it was it wasn't until UFC 14 and I think three years later that they became the standard apparel. But he actually fought in them first, as we said. Felix Lee Mitchell walked in with them, he and then he with gloves, but he didn't wear them. He had his own kind of fingerless uh, bag gloves that he was gonna wear, yeah. and then he took them off. Melton Bowen actually does wear them, and, and you, I know you want to talk about Melton Bowen's past because he actually is uh, really yeah. the probably the, actually no, he is the best boxer, I guess we could yeah. say uh, that the UFC has seen at this point. Yeah, he was an intercontinental heavyweight champion for the. Uh, WBF World Boxing Federation, and he fought for the WBF in a uh, heavyweight title altogether. And at the time he entered the UFC, he was like thirty-two and five. He was a he was billed as a Tyson clone, a hard punching, short, powerful heavyweight. He was basically a a lesser Tyson, much less technique and beatable in much the same way. So he was like Mike Tyson, but one eighth the size. Mike Tyson, but what one eighth the talent? Uh, that's our uh, our second Austin Powers reference of the episode. <laughs> yes, Mi Mini Tyson. Mini Tyson. <laughs> we don't chew on our ears, Mini Tyson. <laughs> yeah, so I just like when when his promo package, he just says simply, you know, my name is Milton Bowen, and I came here to do what I got to do. That's yep, yeah. and lose. That's lose. And to Lose to Steve Jenham, the Ninja Cop, winner of the UFC 3 tournament, the first and only alternate to win a UFC tournament. So this time, Steve Jenham is in the main bracket because he's got to defend his title. Yep. Yeah, and, he's got to uh, defend his title, and this would be the last win of Steve Jenham's career. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, well, it's a good fight. He'll ever Unless we do IVF 1, I don't think he'll ever compete in anything we want to... Oh, no, did he do it? 
He was in an, another UFC, he wasn't was, he? He was in uh, an Ultimate Ultimate, I believe. Yeah, he was in an so. Ultimate Ultimate. Okay, so... We we'll we will cover this. Steve Jenham again. Yeah, but... that's all right. You know, to, to be fair, you, you, Bruce Beck also made some mistakes here in this match in terms of commentating, like we just did here. Like we're we're Bill Wallacing hard today. Oh but, yeah. But uh, Bruce Beck, I think he takes the cake with this one, where he says this is the first time we've ever seen a boxer here. Yes. Did yeah. Anyone... And, and in fact, I mean, because Mountain Bone was very much the same, the exact same thing as Art J- Jimerson, a boxer making a one-time untrained foray into MMA looking for a payday. And Steve Jenner would have none of that because the Ninja no. Cop really just whipped him around pretty good. I mean, I, I, you know, to be oh, fair, yeah. I think Bowen actually did a good job. I yeah, think he defended well as much as he could have. Uh, but Jenner was on display here. Uh, he yeah. did, you know, he got the judo throws, he got the positioning. Jenner was looking really good in this fight. This was what we what we needed to see at UFC three to get him get us behind him. Here at yeah. UFC four, you know, after that fight, now the fans are behind this guy. Yeah, the Ninja Cop had some ninja skills. And Bowen for he had he had some surprising cardio and muscle for as whipped as he was by the time the the fight ended. I think he actually looked in better shape here than he did at UFC three. Wait, Bowen? Uh, Bowen did, or Jenham rather, Jenham. Je, yeah, Jenham looked in better shape. Yeah, no, Bowen was Bowen. But yeah, no, Jenham actually he's in a little bit little bit better shape. Uh, yeah, he looked a little bit more spry. I guess that's what happened had, to him between. He, he had a nice armbar transition from a guy who was trying to post from the bottom, and you know. Oh, yeah, that was a great armbar actually. That was a. Uh, Really, really amazing looking armbar. That was probably the first time we could have seen that sort of armbar. I don't think. Uh, yeah, Hoist has never done the mount armbar. Yeah. Hoist has done the, the from the bottom. Hoist has always been from the bottom. This is the first time that yeah. we've seen it in an offensive way being used. Uh, yeah. From from a mount position. So, you know, and it looked really good. It actually did look really good. It was a really exciting yeah. way to finish the fight, also. So, you yeah. know, Steve Jenham finally did. Now the fans actually give a shit. Yes. So let's move on now to the next round, the last of the uh, tournament fights. And that's going to be and Anthony Macias, the Mad Dog, taking the on Mad Dog, Mad Dog, <laughs> taking on Dan Severn, who does not have a nickname yet. He will soon. No, he is Daniel Severn. Daniel, that's right. Young he's only, Daniel. He's Daniel Severn. He Young Daniel, whose voice I I will always love Dan Severn for his voice because it is the most unfit, unbefitting voice of a man his size. That's right. Yeah. It's, Hello, my name is Daniel Severn, and I'm boring. It's it's just terrible. He's no, got no voice, no charisma. It's much higher than that. Though. It's like, hello, my name is Daniel Severn. I have come to the octagon to. Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little nasally, just like that. Yeah, it is a little nasal. It's that where, where, where he's from. It's that Michigan nasal, I guess. Yeah, that Michigan nasal. Not quite, not quite the uh, Wisconsin, uh, not uh, Wisconsin, but uh, Minnesota nasal. Yeah. But it's halfway there. Halfway there. And he... I, I think I'm gonna cut this since you mentioned. It, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to cut this in. Like, yeah, as we as we will find out at the next event, uh, Dan Severn is a big pro wrestler and he's competed in pro yeah. wrestling before. Uh, I, I remember watching when he was in the IWA King of the Deathmatch '95 tournament, uh, which is you know coming up. You know, obviously this is looking ahead a few months yeah. in the future here. Uh, and he competed that in a super fight to defend his NWA title against Tarzan Goto in a you know Japanese crazy match. And he yeah. cuts this promo. I, I hope I can find it where it's just like. What he says, just it's just so badly delivered. He's like, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know. Tarzan Goto is a great uh, warrior. He will use all means to claim victory, whether it be inside the ring or outside the ring. Early on in the match, he tried to bring me outside the ring. I wanted to keep the action inside because I knew once we did step outside, he would be looking for an object. Not exciting. Not charismatic anyway. That no, just kind of was a simple. terrible pro wrestler. Yes, he was a terrible pro wrestler, terrible on the mic. Uh, you know, he had a few good moves. Um, that was really it. And he had an interesting look. Not a good look, but he's interesting because he's a big yeah. big Tom Selleck lookalike. So, uh, yeah, big, big mon- Tom, Tom Selleck monster. <clears throat> yes, that's it. Tom Selleck monster. Uh, Fra- Franken Selleck. <laughs> yeah, Franken Selleck it is. <laughs> and did, did you see the, uh, the two fat Elvis impersonators in the crowd in this fight? What wasn't so? Was one of them not Andy Anderson? No, there were two other idiots in the audience oh. at the time. But we, yeah, I thought, the, I, I thought the guy doing the Elvis thing sort of like that. You yeah, know, that's but. right. There was a big fat Elvis guy, and, and then at that point when he, when he did the whole thing, like the cameras cut yeah. away. But yeah, yeah, there were two just random fat Elvis guys. They were very into it. They got front row seats. They were excited. They were constantly making Elvis faces the whole night. But since you did bring it up, yes, the the mysterious case, the, the curious case of Andy Anderson. Uh, I think actually I did see him again in this fight, particularly standing out a lot. Uh, as we mentioned last time. UFC 3, some random guy in the audience who looked really familiar to me, Andy Anderson, who uh, is here again. So he's just traveled now from North Carolina to Oklahoma to watch another UFC event. I wonder yeah. what this guy is doing. 
I he was he was bold enough in the audience, and they panned on him heavily they enough. Did. They I did. I noticed him. He I saw him this time. that guy, American flag jacket, in the audience, pointing at the camera. I wrote it down. That's right. He was there. They, they did have a really good pan of him. I'm gonna cut it in here as well if I could find it. Uh, yeah, I, Andy Anderson. We still don't know who this guy is, but this is twice in a row we've seen him. So who knows? I mean, why is this guy traveling around, following the UFC to different states? It's not like he's just in his hometown watching it. He's actually traveling to see this show. So something's happening. Some some bizarre conspiracy is going on. We'll see the culmination of that soon, I imagine. But let's. I I, I imagine maybe perhaps maybe perhaps possibly. Yes. So anyway. Anthony Anthony Macias gets horsed. Yes, that's, that's pretty a good way much. Putting it. That's really it. <laughs> yeah, Macias has Dan no chance. Dan comes in and he puts on one of the best pure displays of wrestling that you will ever see in MMA. I say pure because he did not know how to strike. He did not know how to choke. He just knew how to suplex the shit out of somebody and then grind them into the ground with his arms. That's essentially what has happened here. Uh, those those suplexes. I mean, he got two suplexes. This is the first time we've seen the suplex ever. Uh, although I have it written down here, let's see. Uh, so where, where am I? Here? I'm talking about notes. Kill me the double suplex. Yeah, sorry, there's no double suplex here. But what we do have is uh, Bruce Beck calls it a backflip. And yes. Blattenick calls it a suple. Suple. So which who is knows more what correct? It is. A suple is more correct. I'll never say suple though. A suplex just sounds so much better. I, I, well, are you gonna say guillotine? I always say guillotine, actually. Okay, if you can say guillotine, then we can we can agree to di- we we can we can fudge suplex. Yeah, I, I don't like saying suplex. Just suplex doesn't even sound as, as great as a suplex, as my opinion. I know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Dan Severin, he just he wrestles Anthony Macias into submission. I mean, quite honestly, we're we're really. I think our commentary about this match is longer than the match itself actually was because Severin just really oh, yeah. whips him around, gets two suplexes. Uh, and eventually gets, uh, I think it's a, a sleeper just to finish. So you know, yeah, look at that. Look at that. Dan Severn actually finishing a fight. Yeah, he would. He, he that. would do that a couple of times. People forget about that. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about that more coming up. But uh, Severn actually did finish fights in the early his first appearance, rather. So yeah. Severn moves yeah. on. He looked impressive over Anthony Macias. Uh, I don't really know what else to say, quite honestly, because it was just that well, quick of a fight. the big thing is to say that Dan Severn is the first world class wrestler in MMA. He looks He's like a the beast first in there. Huh? Truly, yeah. the, the wrestler who can truly dominate, who can truly show off wrestling as a martial art and martial discipline. You see what I did there with the beast thing? Yeah, you like that? I, I missed it. You, you, I was oh. talking and not listening. You're not supposed to talk over the host. Don't you know how to do these shows? The host now? I'm the host now, yeah. Just, be- just because you do the post production, you're the host? I get whatever title <laughs> I want. You watch yourself, saying You watch yourself. Unless you, want, unless you want to Bill Wallace mass superpose your face That's right. video. I will make it will that make happen. the mouth move. Yes. <laughs> I will make that happen. Okay, for those wondering about the jump, the mention of Bill Wallace turned Skype in on itself. It is he who shall not be named. And from here on out, we should we should not mention Superfoot. <laughs> Superfoot. S- Superfoot. Superfoot from just now call, on. Just call him Superfoot. That's it. Yep. Dare not speak his real name. No, dare not. So one other thing uh, that's worth mentioning, uh, even though it's not relevant to anything whatsoever about this fight, uh, is during the fight they they mentioned someone in the audience. That's Michelle the Mouse Krasnew. Did you catch that yeah, name? Yeah, I I was wondering. I did not look her up. I should have, but well, I was wondering about that. Yes, Michelle Krasnew is a very well known uh, kickboxer, female kickboxer, and really the only reason I'm mentioning her again uh, is because guess what, Zane? She was on WMAC Masters. Oh. See, we're we're slowly building a long series of tie-ins for our eventual WMAC Masters show. So it's three episodes that we've done where we've mentioned WMAC Masters, and uh, Michelle Kreisman had a pretty big role because I think she was on the second season. I don't think she was on the first. I think she was in the second season only, uh, and she was part of a pretty major storyline. But hopefully, if our fans want us to review that series, maybe we could jump in there and do that. But yeah, it's up to you guys out there watching. Do you want to see us talk about WMAC Masters? I, I don't know. You guys tell us what you want. That's right. That, that The fans get to vote. They get to vote on which thing we'll talk about next. Pride, UFC, uh, maybe IFC, or WMAC rings. Masters. Rings. Oh, or yeah, WMAC rings. Masters. Man, ring, or, or Pancras. But Pancras isn't really... I mean, Pancras is good, but uh, we should do UWF one of these days. UWF. <laughs> that would be fun. There, there we go. Uh, all right. So, yeah, so that was uh, our, our opening rounds of this eight-man tournament. So we move now to the next round. So we have Hoist Gracie versus Keith Hackney. Um, yes. I, I actually was really looking forward to this fight, and it delivered. I thought it was a great, great fight, and a 
I, I guess we can debate this, but I think it was one of the best tests that Hoist has had so far. It wasn't the best test. The best test was chemo. That, that was the best. This was the best. I could best. debate that. I, I could debate that, though, because I think Hackney, you know, chemo had size. Hackney had more skill. Hackney was actually sprawling from takedowns. Uh, he was more agile than Kimo. I'd say Kimo had pure brute strength, but Hackney was bringing a lot more skills to the table. Hackney was bringing a lot more skills, but Hoist put a beating on Hackney. Once it got down to the ground, yeah. No, he was kneeing him on the feet. He was largely just, he had him in the tie clinch, and he was just kneeing him and kneeing him and kneeing him. He couldn't get him down. Yeah, because to be fair, they were Hoist Gracie knees, so there's not really yeah, much power behind and, him. And, and Hackney was getting him, uh, get, getting the, the occasional pu- flurry of mad, wild punches in, but Hoist... He put a beating on him, and when it got to the ground, it was just a it was a great display of jujitsu finesse. Yes, he really finessed him into the, into the submission and got the win. And I mean, this is yeah, Hoist. Obviously, the Van Cleef fight was just terrible, bad, terrible, bad, yo. But um, that fight was definitely a much much tougher test in the tournament yeah. so far. It was a much better chest, and it was really one of the it was it was one of the great displays of Hoist Gracie fighting from over an entire period. Yes, not I, just I him hitting a great move, but from him actually controlling a whole fight. I think this is the most I want to say Hoist has actually really fought, if you will. Yeah, because he yeah. actually had to use all of his tools to do. That's why I think it was a better test because you know for for uh, Kimo it was a little bit more of a war of attrition in that case. Yeah, with Hackney he had to really actually fight. He had to throw hands. He had to use his legs. He had to go to the ground. Uh, he legitimately looked frustrated when Hackney was was defending the takedowns. Like his face, you can see it at one point actually does change where he's like, "What just happened?" Like, no, you're supposed to be on the yeah. ground now. So I, I think Hackney gave him a, a really tough fight. Uh, definitely at this point, the hardest. Uh, you know, besides Kimo being, you know, just besides Kimo just beating him up, uh, toughest actual fight fight. I think that yeah, makes sense. the, the most fight skilled fight. fight. Yeah, uh, def- definitely the most strikes that Hoist has ever used as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I yeah, mean, except- I don't know that he threw that many strikes against Sakuraba. No, <laughs> ninety minutes can't even throw that many strikes. Also, you know, Hackney defended submissions well. You know, uh, Hoist was trying triangles and arm marks constantly off his back, and Hackney was defending them legitimately, not just powering, yeah. not just completely powering out all the time, but actually defending the transitions as well. Yeah, like he came in there pretty well, pretty well prepared. It seemed like people were starting to figure out they they had seen enough of Hoist now to start actually training to fight him. Yes. Uh, so I think it was actually a really, really good fight. I liked it a lot. You know, I didn't really remember this one at all. Uh, I remember I actually didn't remember they had the fight in this tournament. So seeing these two yeah. fight, I was actually really excited for it, and it totally delivered. Uh, but of course, Hoist wins by armbar. Yeah. So as, as it always is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you got to uh, do? That, that's our Hoist. But you know, again, but, Hoist looked very humble in, in the victory as well. Though he wasn't like holding on to the lock too long. Uh, he actually was. He, he looked like he respected Hackney's abilities. Yeah. And Hackney as a person. So. Uh, it was a very good display for Hoist here. Yeah, good good fight. Really surprisingly good test for Hoist. Yes. Which brings us to the second semifinal, or quarterfinal, which was Dan Severn, Marcus Bossett. That's right, because and, uh, Bossett, as we know, the alternate had to come in, the grasshopper, yep. replacing, yep. Uh, was it, I believe, Steve Jenham. Yep, replacing Steve Jenham, who I believe hurt his hand. No, I think... He did he hurt his hand I think or did it was he a hand injury? Back? It was a hand injury. Yeah, it was a hand injury. Yeah, which is they were all hand injuries. Pretty much, early that's, on. that's all they really do. Yeah, all they really do is throw punches, yeah. bare knuckle punches to skulls. Uh, yeah, and it's unfortunate because I, I actually would have really have liked to have seen Gentleman Severn. That would have been fun. Yeah, but I, well, I don't know that it would have gone a lot different than Bossett Severn, no, honestly. Not not really, but I think uh, I I feel like that Gentleman would have definitely put up a better fight. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, I okay. I have a soft spot for Marcus Bossett that I can't say. explain other than having read, you know, read stuff, a bunch of stuff on him. Now you just like kung fu, admit it. Well, I, I yeah. love kung fu, but Bossett looked of the guys who were really hyper traditional martial artists. He looked in the most control standing up. He looked. I, I could see that. Yes, I, I could agree with that. I mean, that kick he hit Severn with to open that fight was brutal it was technically great and it looked like it hurt a lot oh yeah you heard the noise it made too yeah you heard the it, it was a it was i mean because they say that whole like oh the slap and the thud it sounded like both it yeah. was like it was a very very good solid kick it was a very solid kick and the, the spinning kick he tried to throw i mean it technically it looked good 
I, it yeah. actually did look technically good. He just missed it and, you know, from there on got ha his ass handed to him. I mean, it's pretty obvious that the, that the kick, uh, you know, did do some damage to Severn. Otherwise, he yeah. probably wouldn't have shot as quickly as he did. I mean, obviously, as a wrestler with very little skills beyond that, he'd want to use his wrestling right away, but... Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know if Severn wanted to go right that quick into that double. Like he probably wanted to do some. He probably wanted to pressure around the cage a little more, and make sure he had no escape route, because that's really yeah. what it was a takedown right in the middle of the cage. Yeah. So uh, you know, and that's probably not the ideal thing for a wrestler to do. Um. So obviously that kick hurt like hell, and Severn wanted to get him down, and it was a good looking takedown. Uh, yeah. And an easy it, takedown as well. You know, really, Bossa had no answer for that takedown whatsoever. Oh yeah. Bossa was all karate at that point. He really. <laughs> he even he said he he had no idea what he was doing on the ground. He fought a few more times in his career. Don't know that he maybe he made another UFC appearance I after this. I believe he did. I think this was his one time uh, appearance in the cage. Um, he but he didn't. Um, yeah, no, that was his only. No, he was Ultimate Ultimate. Really? What was he there? An yep. Ultimate? Yep. Hey, no, uh, uh, ninety six Ultimate Ultimate. He, he yeah, it might have been as an alternate. Wow, what a bizarre fact. first time as an alternate, but whatever. <laughs> I um, guess I guess he looked impressive with his one kick. Yeah, he was he was an alternate in that. And that was, the, but that was also the end of his fighting career. We'll get to it at the time. But after that, he went on to train with uh, Gokor Chivich, uh, Chivichin. Gokor Chivichin, yeah. Yeah. And actually, so he then learned how to fight on the ground, which he would not know how to do at the time he was in, actually fighting. Yeah, so it wasn't really much of a fight either way, though. Once he got down to the ground, Severin got the mount, got the arm, triangle choke, uh... First and, time. Was it triangle choke? Oh, yeah, it was. It was basically, a, it was almost Close enough. A, Basically a smother. It was a smother, yeah. Let's get serious. It was really him smothering him with his forearm. But it really was, uh, you know, close enough to being an arm triangle choke, which looked pretty good. And once again, Dan Severn has now finished two opponents in a row. Yep. And that's not going to happen probably ever again. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Dan Severn wins this one. He moves on. Uh, a good-looking win for him. And, and at this point, too, Severn, uh, to be quite fair, he's barely been in an octagon. He's looked dominant oh, yeah. in both performances. So he's coming in there pretty fresh. Hoist has had a pretty tough fight against Hackney. So we have our finals at this point now, which is going to be uh, much more tired, but not necessarily exhausted, but a tired uh, Hoist Gracie it's taking it, on yeah. pretty much a fresh Dan Severn. Yeah, and th and it should be noted too that Dan, I would say Dan Severn, more so than Chemo even, and most more so than Ken certainly, was the the UFC's first real true heavyweight. Yes, he was a big, big dude, as you guys can tell. He's like a giant Kodiak bear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't like he was he wasn't muscle bound. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I've got 100 pounds extra muscle on me. It was that I have a massive frame, yeah. and I'm in good shape with that massive frame. And so, yeah, I mean, he was just gigantic. And how, how old was he here, exactly? Was he 35. 35? He was 35, okay, yeah. So he's, uh, you know, he would have been the oldest competitor had not Ron Van Cleef been in there. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if that's true. I think there might have been a couple. No, because... Uh, Ro uh, oh, I was, I was thinking, yeah, I was just thinking Rosier, actually. He's probably older. Not Well, Rosier, I don't think, was, but, um, oh, who was the kickboxer, Nevada State kickboxer, um, who fought Fred Eddish? Johnny Rhodes. Oh, I, I, mean, I, mean this, I mean, in this event, though, not uh, not overall. Oh, oh, in this event, he yeah, might, event, yeah he was... I don't know how old Rosier was at the time, but he certainly... There were certainly older people than Severn who'd fought in the UFC. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's what I doubt. But uh, you know, in this uh, tournament, though, I mean, he's got he's uh, definitely he's the, up there. He's he's up there. He's well, he's the oldest for this tournament except for Ron Van Cleef. What the point of this was, I don't know. I just wanted to mention that. But just my trivia. He's thirty five already, and the point yeah. is, you know, he's thirty five now. Here we are, twenty basically twenty years later, and he's just retired. So you do the yeah. <laughs> he just retired this year. He'd already been a you know competing at the highest levels of amateur wrestling. He was very, very close to being in the Olympics and had beaten some of the re best freestyle wrestlers in the world already in the 80s. So, Yeah, we'll spend more time, I think, discussing Severn's history coming up. Uh, cause oh, there's, there's, a talk about him about him. there's a lot more we could say about him, though, in his origins in the sport, even. There's a lot to say about Dan Severn. Uh, but let's just move on to the next match, because uh, we actually now, since the last event, things have changed in terms of the layout of the tournaments. Uh, and because of what happened with the whole debacle of Ken and Hoist and the whole exhaustion and all this and that, there's now a match in between the finals to give the guys in the finals a little bit of a rest. So we have, uh, and it's not an alternate match, it's actually a qualifiers match. So the winner of this fight will advance to be in a tournament at UFC 5. So we've got uh -huh. Jason Farron and the debut of Guy Mesger. Mesger. Yes, and Farron was a 
he he was a club fighter out of Toronto and a uh, much like and this is one of the things that I think doesn't get enough play in the history of the UFC is I I kind of feel like the Gracies were a bit starstruck because I mean they were in the whole like California scene and they were becoming known as like. You know, the place you go for real fighting in Hollywood, basically. Yeah. And they were starting to get this whole, like, you know, oh, yeah, we know these people who are sort of film connected and, you know, trying to do the whole Hollywood thing. And Fam was ready. He was, he, he much like, uh, oh, oh, Alberto Cerro Leone, the Pentax lot fighter. Yes, our good friend they, from UFC, too. They were both. Uh, like Hollywood bodyguards huh. who come to train at the Gracie Academy, and that was how they got into the UFC events. Go figure. Yeah. So that was what Jason Farron was doing there. He's still a Hollywood bodyguard. Oh, he could pass for a pro wrestler with that hair he has. Yeah, I thought he was and, a Canadian and, pro wrestler. So he fought Guy Medzger in a no hair pulling match. That's right, because at this point, there's still again there are no rules. But, uh, but there was an agreement between the two to not pull each other's hair, as they mentioned uh, with the commentators, yes. uh, because they both have incredibly long hair. <laughs> yeah. Greasy, long hair. Yes. Man. Uh, so, yeah, there was uh, – I don't really know what to say about this fight. I mean, it wasn't really anything too spectacular, but it was the debut of Guy Mesger. He's, it's his pre-Lions Den Guy Mesger also. It, um, is it pre-Lions Den? I believe well, – yeah. there was no Lions Den with him uh, uh, when he walked uh. out, so I would assume he's not Lions Den yet. Yeah. He was just a karate guy, a kickboxer with a karate background at this point. And a legit, pretty legit kickboxer, not like, you know, not really internationally competing on the international circuit kind of kickboxer, but an American kickboxing champion for what that's worth. Yeah, so Mesger Fair, there's really not much to this. Uh, there's a lot of clinching and a lot of groin punching. Uh, that's really all I remember for the fight, to be honest. <laughs> not much else. Yeah. The, the big thing I want, the only thing I really want to talk about with Guy Mesger, because he, he's such a weird, he's a footnote in MMA history, really. You know, he, he never, he had a long and good career, very successful, but he, ne you know, it was never, like, he was never quite a big star of the sport. Yeah, for whatever reason, he always just kind of middle ground. You know, he never really yeah. made it to top level. But he, he was really one of the first fighters to really show a lot of great transition between yes. being able to to grapple and to be able to strike. I, I agree. And that's why it always surprised me that he never really made it higher than he did because uh, I thought he was very good. And well, he was a paint race champion, so he made it that far at least. Yeah, but then the end, so was Jason Delucia. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, no, Jason there. Delucia wasn't. Oh, he wasn't. Oh, that's right. Delucia never made it to the pancreas title, to a wow. pancreas title. Well, suck on that, Delucia. <laughs> For all of his, like, 15 years there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a never-ending journey there. He Taught himself anything. to play guitar, never <laughs> won a title in Pancras. Oh, man. So, yeah, I mean, really, this fight, not much else I can say, though. Eventually, Mesker gets a takedown. He gets to the mount. Uh, I believe he I believe he pummels him just until the towel gets thrown in. Mesker looked pretty good. Uh, yeah. And so he won a spot in UFC 5 that he would never take. Yes. For whatever reason, uh, Mesker does not appear in UFC 5. Spoiler alert. Uh, we're not going to see him again, in fact, until UFC 13. Long yeah, he ran down. off to Pancrase and fought there a whole bunch. Yes, he did. So, I really don't know much more beyond that as to why. I'll have to, we'll have to look it up for the next episode, maybe. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Guy Mesger, that's his debut. It was good enough for me. Yeah. That's about all I can say. But, you know, we'll see more Mesger. In the, Worth in the noting, years. great fighter. Worth noting that this is where you see him fight first. Yes. So, let's just move on now to uh, the finals. And, uh, yeah, so here we are. Finals. Dan Severn, Hoist Gracie, uncut and uncensored, as the VHS yeah. said. And, man, it really is uncut, but I wish they had cut it because, wow. Oh, I mean, God. Oh, man. Uh, so, interestingly enough, the commentators do immediately question Severn's ability to finish the fights. They're like, you know, here's a wrestler. He doesn't really know how to finish. I mean, even though he just finished two fights, they're beginning to already question his ability to finish. Uh, the, 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 the bloom is off the rose already. Yeah, the luster is already beginning to diminish. Um, Hoist is coming to this fight also. You know, he just had a very tough fight, as I mentioned before, against Hackney. Yeah. His face, it's, it's cut off. It's, he looks... He's, he's been in a war, basically. You can tell. Yeah. Severn, pretty fresh still. Yeah, Severn, Severn really was fresh. And what's interesting is that apparently... So apparently they brought in Severn because they wanted to end it, lend an extra air of legitimacy to their whole package with, like, the whole getting into the American wrestling. And he was a real great wrestler with a big background with, you know, all these great wrestling titles. 
And then they immediately realized that he was basically unmarketable. Yep, he had no ability to talk, not much skill set beyond takedowns, and uh, no, really no ability to finish, unfortunately. Even though we just saw him finish two fights against the lesser opponents, when it came time to actually fight guys who were skilled, uh, yeah, no, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's really the story of this fight, was that had Severn been able to ha you know punch or submit at all, he probably could have gotten an exhausted Hoist Gracie. Yes. That's the crazy thing, because Severn did take down Hoist so easily. Like, oh, yeah. No effort. He got Hoist right down to the mat immediately. That's basically, you know, not quite the beginning of the match, but, you know, a little bit into it. A really short filling out period, but then boom, right down to the ground he goes. Uh, and then from there, though, Severn was just stuck in Hoist's guard, didn't do anything. He really barely tried to punch. Uh, he didn't try to pass at all. And even, even when Hoist had his open guard, like, no attempts to even get past those legs. He just smothered him and just yep. tried to blanket him, you know, like, that, that was it. That was really the whole fight right there, just Severn not really knowing what to do, not really trying to do anything either. So, I mean, no, you know, no. Yeah, you gotta wonder, like, what was his strategy? Was his strategy just purely to tire Hoist out and make him quit that way? Or was he looking for a finish? We'll never really know, but I, I really, I can't decipher what his goal was in that fight. Well, I think he trained for MMA for four days before he took his run at the UFC. That was his background. Um, so he learned how to do a sleeper and an arm triangle. Yeah, maybe a chicken wing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bob back in time I do a chicken wing, one of their wrestling matches. Um, but he, uh, yeah, I think he really was hoping, which happened for the two fights previous, that Gracie would basically panic. You know, because he was so huge and so strong that Gracie would get under him, get exhausted, get frustrated, panic and tap out. But it didn't stop, you know, his complete lack of plan did not stop um, Blatnik totally, totally just oh, man. Yeah. riding him as hard as he could. Zane, just, do you think that Jeff Blatnik likes wrestlers at all? I, you know, maybe. And maybe maybe Jeff Blatnick is a little bit of a wrestling fan. He might be. I, I I guess so. I mean, yeah, the whole time he was just really, you know, riding on the unsevered. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. Like everything he did and, and poo pooing everything that Hoist tried to do. He's like, oh, he's got nothing there. That's, yeah. that's, that's really it, it, the best was, part it of It was bad because it, it, it sort of, I got to say, it kind of ruined the grand submission call. Yeah. <laughs> because, it was, you know, Hoist is locking in the triangle and. Blatnik is like, oh, he's got nothing with that elbow lock. Yeah, then you know? know, moments later, oh, Severn's tapped out. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, Joe, uh, uh, Jim Brown sort of salvaged it by, you know, with this whole screaming, oh, my God, oh, my God. Yeah. It was unbelievable. That was amazing to salvage the call. But Blatnik was just like, nah, there's nothing going on there. Yeah. And to be fair, it was actually a relatively impressive win in a way. Uh, because yeah. uh, because you know Hoist survived 16 minutes against Dan Severn, uh, which is the longest UFC fight to date now. And, yeah. Uh, you know, 16 minutes being smothered by Dan Severn, not panicking, looking a lot better than he did uh, than Chemo, but mostly because Chemo was actually punching. Uh, yeah. Whereas Dan Severn did not. Dan just blanketed and smothered. Um, but you know, I mean, what can you really say? It was 16 minutes of Dan Severn in Hoist's guard. That's really it. That's really the fight. Yeah. Uh, it's not. All right. It's not gonna be. It's not the most boring fight we'll ever see Dan Severn in. Uh, no. Far from it. But far it was, uh, from <laughs> it. Was, but it was not really much to watch, and there's really not much more commentary you can say beyond just Hoist wins by triangle. It, well, I would say the whole tournament's really impressive for Hoist. Yeah, it was, big gift. wins all around for Hoist. Yeah, he gets a gift in his first fight, but his second fight was hard, and his third fight, you know. He may not have had a lot of damage to worry about, but it was grueling. Yes, yeah, 16 minutes in there against a guy that big. You know, who, who has, you know, when you have, as we as we will see in the future, when you have that wrestling ability, being able to hold a guy down, it's a skill that is, uh, at this point, not really realized. And Dancer was the first guy to really kind of do that, to show, you know, what it actually means to be under a guy who can hold you down there. From yeah, and he, Severn did have uh, an underappreciated skill that, I mean, it's not a finishing skill, but it's not it a fan friendly skill, really. It's like, it's like, you know, yeah. compared today, like to Ben Askren, and, and, you know, it's not a fan friendly style when you don't really understand what's happening. Yeah, and and but he, what he had is an appreciable skill that they talk with a lot of the old fashioned wrestlers. That's it's something that's even sort of gone away with the modern UFC, which is the ability to make everything you do 
hurt the person that you're doing it to. And it, so, it makes it look so yeah. easy as well. That's something that these wrestlers do is they make it look so damn easy. It looks like they're doing nothing at all. And in reality, it's a very, very difficult skill to master to be able to hold the guy down, to force your will on them so that they can't do a damn thing for however long the fight is. But, but I mean, like, Dan, you know, Dan Tepper might he might shift one arm across Hoist's, you know, across Hoist's head, but it wouldn't just be like, oh, I'm going to move my arm over here. It's I'm going to drag my forearm across your face for as long and slow as I can, and grind every time I put a hand on you, it's going to be to grind my fingers into you and grind yes. my elbows, and it was just all pain, Absolutely. pain moves. It's a long, grueling grappling match. Uh, but like I said, Hoist gets the win. He's now yep. won his third tournament. Uh, sorry, Steve Jenham. So Hoist now he, he celebrates the ring, and hey, guess who's back? Brian Kilmeade. Yay! Yay! I, I guess yeah. So Kilmeade. <laughs> Kill me finally resurfaces in at the end of the night. I guess he's been locked up backstage. He finally found the key to break out. Uh, That's right. He yeah. had stuff. Blatnik stuffed him in a locker yeah. before the, before fight time. Get in there, nerd. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess somebody let, let kill me out, and he must have found a microphone somewhere because he runs into the cage <laughs> trying to do a post fight with Hoist. But no, it's not happening. Like there's there's no post fight interview with Hoist. Kill me yeah. just in there, just, just stuck on the outskirts, and that's it. That's that's that is our final. Ryan Kilmeade appearance ever in the history of the It's Ghost a State. deserving final appearance. It is a perfect way to, to say farewell to Brian Kilmeade. It's a, it's a well-deserved, complete facing of Brian Kilmeade on his way out of the promotion. Man. So, oh, yeah, that, that is UFC 3 in a nutshell. And it was, uh, again, a, a pretty good show. I, I like the show a lot. It was a yeah. very good, good showing for Hoist Gracie. This is uh, yeah. exactly what he needed to get the fans behind him again uh, to, to make up for what happened at UFC 3. Everything went right for him. Uh, it's just unfortunate that he had to go against a guy like Dan Severn, who uh, is now kind of positioned to be the next big thing in the UFC. Yeah. Which, Surprisingly, of all people. Yeah, I mean, if, I don't know if you read Tom's whole big thing on, like, the search for stars in the teen years, but uh, it, he did a good job talking about how very soon the UFC would get into a desperate search for a new great fighter, and Dan Severn was a big part of that. Yeah, I and mean, that's really what kind of happens with these early UFC that we're going to see is that, I don't want to call them generations, but essentially it's a new era. And this is uh, yeah. essentially the end of the Hoist Gracie era. And we're now into the Dan Severn era. Yeah, was it, was this the last Hoist Gracie tournament before... This is, the final time the, Hoist, this is the final time that Hoist will be appearing in a UFC tournament. Yeah, so the Gracies, we got, we got to say goodbye to Hoist. Well, well, we have to say goodbye to Hoist in the tournaments, but we're not done with Hoist. He will be back. At UFC 5. But let's, we'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. Oh, yes. If we're going to say goodbyes right now, let's say goodbye to a lot of guys that aren't coming back again. Uh, or, or rather, yeah. we'll, say, we'll say who's coming back. Uh, let's say, you know, Dan Severn will be back. We're not done with Dan him. Dan Severn will be back. Marcus Hoist. Bossett will be back. Hoist will be back. Guy Mesger. <laughs> now, Guy Mesger was supposed to be back at UFC 5, as he mentioned, but for whatever reason, we don't see him again uh, yeah. until UFC 13. So it's farewell for now to Guy Mesger. Keith Hackney will be back. Yes, Keith Hackney, thankfully. I, I, I remember him being back, and I'm very happy to see him back. You know, I forgot how much of a fan I was of him when I first started watching these UFCs. And seeing him again, I remember why I liked him so much. So I'm happy that he's yeah. not gone yet. Um, Ron Van Cleef is gone from competition, but he's not completely gone, as we're going to see. Melton Bowen is gone. He will, he had a boxing career after this, which got worse, much like Art, <laughs> Art Jimerson. Curse of it, Superfoot. Yeah, much like Art Jimerson, this was his this was his transition point to being a reasonable pro boxer. <laughs> To then being a guy who got knocked out a few times. He's still, his whole career was, he ended up at like, you know, 30, 36 and 8 or something. It was not a bad career by any means. But he got on the end of a couple of brutal KOs after this. Um, I'm happy to say goodbye to Joe Sun. Oh, God. Joe Sun is gone. Good riddance. Not done with, with combat sports, though. And I think it, we really should consider doing a Joe Sun retrospective because he's done so many horrible things in combat sports and in life. So I yeah. think he deserves his own video at some point. We'll have to cover him he, another time. He, he is one of the worst people to ever enter professional fighting competition. Yeah, that's that's really a very polite way of putting it. But uh, also, um, who else are we going to miss? Oh, we're going to miss Anthony Macias. Now, I, I don't believe he comes back. Anthony Macias is back. Of, he does. Of course, he, he is infamously part of one of the... Oh, that's right, yes. So, you... yeah, we'll, we'll hold off on that, but Anthony Macias yeah. is back. We don't, we don't want to give any too many spoilers. Anthony, but, uh... I will say this of Anthony Macias. Anthony Macias is notable for the incredible number of... or the incredible fighters he's lost to. That's right. I remember uh, 
He's fought a lot of big names. He's lost all of them. So yeah. we're going to see him again. He's a whole bunch of really unknown fighters, and he has lost to a lot of big names. That's how you get the paydays. Yep. Just say Bob Sapp. Yeah. Oh, we get to say goodbye to Eldo Diaz Xavier. And Was it really that big of a farewell? <laughs> no. We Not really. saw hello to him. We get to say goodbye to him as well. And, and uh, does Farron come back? I feel like Farron has another appearance. I don't think he does. Jason Farron. This, no, this was his only appearance at the high end of the sport. Oh, he, we if we want to cover MFC 2, we can say hello to Jason Farron again. Yeah, let's just say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, let's just say goodbye. Let's not cover the MFC. But yeah, so UFC 4, uh, What'd you think? I mean, I, I think it was a pretty good event. I was happy with it. It's I, I the had the event to watch. It's the event to watch if you really want to understand why Hoist Gracie was a big deal. Yeah. I would say. This was definitely uh, his best win in the tournaments, and, uh, you know, it's a good way for him to step out of tournaments because he's got yep. bigger things to do now at this point. no more. There's no point in a guy at this point being as marketable as he is for the UFC to continue doing the tournaments. Uh, yeah. There's really nothing in it for him at this point. He's getting, And obviously, also, the fights are getting tougher for him. So, yeah. you know, why keep doing these tournaments when he could just be doing something else? And guess what? He will be doing something else. All sorts of things. All sorts of things. Uh, anything else we need to say about UFC 4? I don't really think there's much else. Uh, no, I mean, it really, it's the end of the Gracie tournament era, and it's the begin. it's a shift. I mean, it's part of the fluidity of the UFC events getting more polished and better produced and having a much more... Um, well run feel to them, but it um it's other so it, it has mark markable places in in MMA history and in UFC history, but unlike it, it's not that exciting. No, it really wasn't. Uh, I guess the most exciting of the events. Uh, we had some good moments with Joe yeah. and Keith Hackney. I think actually, I guess really for me at least, you know, Hackney was the highlight of the show. Seeing both yeah. of his fights was uh, I think the best two fights of the night. They, in my opinion. they actually showed that. That clip of Joson and Keith Hackney when they reported on Joson's trial. <laughs> of all the things to show, the poor guy. Well, I mean, it really, to be fair, that's no, probably the most fitting. flattering. That's the most flattering clip of Joson ever in MMA. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fitting. So yeah, UFC four. In the record books, uh, good show for Hoist. Not really the most exciting, but there's a few good moments, and it's yeah. worth checking out for those moments, really. Um, yeah. If you ever have to sit through Hoist Gracie, Dan Severn, fast forward. Yeah, yeah. There's really not much to watch other than, other than hearing Jeff Blatnick uh, talk about how great wrestling is. Yeah, talk about how great wrestling is. I think at some point that may be, it may have been that where he talked about Dan Severn getting a hip lock. Yes. <laughs> when he throws Hoist Gracie. And also, of course, another, another highlight of the show is uh, seeing Andy Anderson again. Yes. So, yeah, so we'll have good Curious, news. curious. Andy Anderson. Well, I, I think the case of Andy Anderson is going to be solved at our, our next event, uh, which All is right. UFC 5. I look five. forward to it, because I honestly don't know what, what you're go getting at. Yeah. I don't know where you're going. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going either with this, but Andy Anderson, that's all. Andy All Anderson, right. guys, he's going to be back, I guess, coming up really soon. We're going to see him. Uh, so, yeah, we, we now depart and prepare for UFC 5, and this one is named, well, now, you know, now we have our new star, apparently, because it's going to be Return of the Beast. Because now Mr. Return of the Beast. Because young Daniel Severn is now Dan the Beast Severn. In, in a few months between this event and number five, Dan gets a whole personality makeover yeah, by they, the marketing they, team. Well, they're really trying to. They they fight, figured out that Dan Severn had a, uh, a he had a pro wrestling persona to bank on, and they were going to try and do what they could to turn him into the next big UFC star. I mean, to be fair, he had a quite impressive run at this ufc tournament uh you know mostly because those two suplexes i, I guess yep. really it was those two suplexes that got him so over with the fans and that's enough to bring him back and market a whole event around his name but uh severin will be back at return of the beast and also we're gonna have uh our first ever ufc super fight championship that's, oh i gotta mention that marcus bossett claims responsibility for developing the idea of the ufc belt which led to the ufc super fight i think we should save that one for the next video all right. Well, he, he, okay. Next time, then. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, I took your steam away. I know. I'm sorry. I, but I, I think <sighs> that's, that's worth saving for the next one. we got to make the guys come back to see something, right? Yes. So I, I'll, t I'll tease Marcus Bossett's story on developing the UFC belt. Yes, and I will tease more drama between Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie, as well as Andy Anderson. 
All right. And probably another reference to WMAC Masters on the way. And just because we haven't done it yet, but I've been holding off on it. Oh, hey, Zane, by the way, Yama count for this week. Um, Pat Smith, Beck, and Vlatnik. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> All these men were in Yama pit fighting. Can't, can't, nary a week goes by when I don't reflect on how, <laughs> on the incredible event that was Yama pit fighting. And to be fair, we could technically call four, because Phyllis Lee was the manager of Dan Severn, and Phyllis Lee was at this event, so therefore, four, because Phyllis Lee was also Ron Waterman's manager, and Ron Waterman was at Yama pit fighting. He was in, so, he was an alternate, basically. So that wasn't Dan Severn's mom? No, that was his mom, or his grandma, or his great-grandma. That was his manager. <laughs> Wow, that is shocking. Yes. Of all all right. People. So that is UFC 4, the Revenge of the Warriors. I think there was plenty of revenge happening, and there was plenty of warrioring as well. So I think with that, uh, I am the fight nerd. That's Zane Simon over there, and we got nothing. Got nothing. See you next time. See you really, next really, time. Really, we have nothing. Turn off the video now. Goodbye. Go away. Yeah. All right, done. <laughs> click, click.